By now, we've seen pretty much all the vehicles in this game in action. Many of them are absurd contraptions. Some of them are just regular vehicles with a little flourish to them. One of them sticks out from the rest by being merely a car. That would be this station wagon driven by the Joneses. We, the Jones family, would like to say to our fans out there, and there's lots of you, that we're thankful for your support. And we'll try to meet all of you so we can say thanks much. And we'll visit with you, and we'd probably need to stay with you a little while till uh, we, uh, you know, move on and visit someone else. Yep, that's it from us to you good people out there in Fanland. The Joneses are more than likely a reference to uh, National Lampoon's Vacation. Twisted Metal Head On, years later, also had an extremely overt reference to National Lampoon's Vacation in the form of a boss named Cousin Eddie. And I like to point those out where the canon games almost certainly drew inspiration, we'll say, from the non-canon games that they tried to distance themselves from. Anyway, winning on these streets means getting off the beaten path. That is our tip for the Road Rage level. They also provided something of a visual clue in the crystal ball during that loading screen. So we'll just have to find some structure that looks sort of like an overpass with a bunch of yellow arrows above it. Like that one. But it says we need to get off the beaten path. The arrows indicate the correct path. So if we go the opposite way, Secrets abound. Not many secrets, if we're being honest. This is maybe the most underwhelming secret area of the entire game. But it does give us an environmental weapon, the Lightning Strike. Get ready for a mild screen flashing effect. As far as I've been able to tell from my experimentation, the Lightning affects this little alleyway, the secret area, and no other part of the level. So it's a good thing two enemies happen to pile up right in that spot, right as I grab the lightning. Otherwise, it would have just shocked me. Speaking of lightning striking, our soundtrack for this level. I'm not going to get any better segue into Lightning Strikes by Cypress Hill. Every single level in this game has a licensed track to it. Three of them are by or at least associated with Rob Zombie. This leaves five other levels to be scored by licensed tracks by different artists. And so far, they have chosen quite a wide variety. In keeping with this game's general lack of a focused theme, might as well make the most of it by using a really unfocused mixtape as the soundtrack. Not that this level is particularly out there. Just a series of highways, all interconnected. Modest Mouse would call this the Interstate 8. But Twisted Metal 4 calls it Road Rage. And it is one of the least raging levels in the game. Or in the series, I would say. If you haven't seen the entirety of this level yet, it is huge. We had six enemies total to fight, and we are going to struggle to find any of them. You could be hot on someone's trail, but if you lose track of them for a second, it could easily be another minute before you figure out where they went. Which can be very frustrating. If you pin an enemy down, make sure you kill them. Once they're out of sight, they're just gone. Find someone else to kill at that point. The little booster pads really just make it easier for them to get away. Of course, proximity mines prove to be very, very useful here. The roads are relatively narrow, making them difficult to avoid, and the AI insists on driving down the yellow line anytime they are not engaged in combat, because they are such rebels. So if you happen to have some proximity mines, might as well just lay them in a line down the center of the road, and occasionally you will hear a distant scream of an enemy blowing themselves up. There's another one down, although Pizza Boy got away while we were distracted. Let's celebrate by taking in the scenery. These two textures are repeated all over the level and they are the only bit of flavor we're gonna see. 
because all roads lead to East Erie and Grim Avenue, in the sense that they all lead nowhere. So we might not see another enemy for a long time. Might as well stock up for a while. Grab health refills lest they do the same. And see if we can find anyone to finish off. Mr. Grimm's here. Stepped out of his own avenue to engage in some combat. And by that I of course mean Captain Grimm. Mr. Grimm is not in this game. Someday I'll come to terms with that fact, but not today. So, while we're wandering around with no target, let's talk about uh, why weapons tend to do so little damage. And it's because there's a huge delay between each time you can fire them. Every weapon has a whole lot of cooldown for some reason. I'm firing my missiles as fast as I possibly can. Their individual damage is not so great, but the fact that they fire so slow really I think is the killer. Obviously speed missiles can be fired very quickly, that's their whole gimmick. And they've been improved in this game so that you can just hold down the fire button and it will constantly fire speed missiles until you run out of them. They are effectively a upgrade to our machine gun. And using booster pads I managed to hit myself with my own ricochet bomb. A massive problem in Twisted Metal 2. Now you have to go out of your way to do it in Twisted Metal 4. Anyway, huge cooldown every time you fire a weapon, severely limiting your potential DPS. But that cooldown only applies to the weapon you're firing. So if you fire something, then switch to another weapon and fire that, it will go off instantaneously, with no cooldown whatsoever. Then if you switch again, you can fire the next weapon. And in that way you can dump your entire inventory, basically instantaneously, in a constant stream of tremendous amounts of damage. The drawback being that it is nearly impossible for the human mind to keep track of what you're firing in what order, so as to actually aim it at a target, resulting in a whole bunch of wasted ammunition. More often than not, I just do that accidentally when I'm firing something non-stop. Then I happen to run out of it in my inventory, and it auto-switches to my next weapon, fires that immediately, which can be a big problem if it's something like a freeze bomb, because then I just immediately freeze myself. We're down to just two enemies left, and they may as well be needles in a haystack for how easy it's going to be to find them and finish them off. Coincidentally, they happen to be the two vehicles that are returning favorites from earlier in the series. The Captain Grimm, and General Warthog, whose name now sounds like an STI. It's actually kind of appropriate, because he's about as hard to get rid of as that particular STI. Anyway, I kind of like how gigantic the levels are in this game. Most of them are extremely, extremely large. This is actually one of the largest. But I do wish they had designed the AI to be more aggressive in tracking you down, because it is far too easy to just get yourself lost, be nowhere near a target for an extended period of time, and then what are you going to do with your life? No combat in your car combat game. Hyperspace turns out to be an excellent addition for navigating these gigantic levels, putting you in a different random location. However, once again, it's not random. When you hyperspace, it will set you to the first spawn location. And if you're in the first spawn location, it will transport you to the second spawn location when you use hyperspace. But if you move even slightly out of that first spot, it will just transport you back to the first spot. Which I did just there, wasting my entire energy bar, getting me no closer to anybody. And I'm on a ticking clock to get rid of Captain Grimm before he finds a health refill. Drags this thing out even more, but there he is. Spotted him in the distance. Kinda hard to see. When I learned that this game had a pirate version of Mr. Grimm in it, I really hoped they had gone all out and made it like a pirate ship with wheels. But no, it's sort of just like a car with a cannon on the front sort of a sail on top, but it's like sideways, so it doesn't look like a sail. Missed opportunity. 
which uh, the game Critical Depth took. That game does have a playable pirate ship in it. But because they did not fulfill the maximum potential for ridiculousness, they ended up with a vehicle that looks almost exactly like Mr. Zombie's Dragula, and I can't tell them apart when they're in the same level together. But we are about to finish off Warthog with our special The Hornet, a trio of homing missiles colored red, white, and blue. For some reason, the Joneses adopted Warthog's old Patriot Missile special. Warthog got a new special. And speaking of old classics, Thumper arrived, but he's now Super Thumper, our boss for the level. Since we might not see him for a while, here's a billboard for Dada. It's not advertising the fact that this game is actually a very Dadaist experience. That is actual ad space purchased by the Dada Footwear Company, who I understand had a pretty rough 2000s and are just sort of limping along today. Despite the endorsement by Twisted Metal 4. Hard to believe, I know. And there was also a bunch of billboards that just say UB on them. Those are even harder to figure out what they are advertising. That is Union Bay, an extremely old logo for a clothing company called Union Bay, who also persist but no longer use that logo, so no one knows what those two letters mean in this game. And here is Thumper, an old favorite, spruced up and given preposterous amounts of armor. But otherwise, the same as Fighting Thumper has always been. Just don't let him look directly at you or you will be burned to death. Medusa rules apply. Now, because he is such a long vehicle, there's a huge amount of distance from bumper to bumper on that thing. The AI seems to have a very hard time navigating these narrow streets. So, as a result, whenever we get Thumper around, he's going to try to spin around to face us. And he's probably going to crash headlong into a wall. Then we're going to get to shoot him in the side a whole bunch, which, because he's so long, is quite easy to do makes for a very wide target when he's stuck sideways, making this a tremendously easy boss fight. As you would expect, I mean, he's supposed to just be a normal vehicle in the previous games. It's only been moderately upgraded here. Hypothetically, it makes sense that he would be such a pushover. We are still on the ranking of scouts, so everyone should be a pushover. It's the lowest difficulty. Next time, things get super weird when we go to the bedroom. But for now, we get to watch the Joneses ending. Ralph Jones here, Mr. Tooth. Then all I want to say is that, uh, hey, this is some nice place you got here. Really upscale. What do you think, Meg? Nice, huh? Really nice, Mr. Tooth. Ahem, <clears throat> I believe you have won. I want to clear all of that room. I want to clear. Kids. Don't embarrass Mr. Tooth, who's kind enough to... Give you one wish, Mrs. Jones. Mr. Troll, we... Why, I am a clown! Right, Mr. Mr. Clown, we love clowns. We the Joneses wish for the top of the line Road Luster 3000 trailer. Uh, granted. With the optional two full um, tanks of propane, sir. Granted. And the three month service contract option to pick a summer driver. Granted. And that summer driver we want is Mr. Tooth. Granted for the sake of all that is sane. That's it. It's parked outside. Someone will see you out. Goodbye. 22 bottles of beer on the wall, 22 bottles of beer, if one of them bottles of beer on the wall, 21 bottles of beer on the wall, 21 bottles of beer, if one of them bottles of beer on the wall, 21 bottles of beer on the wall, Normally in these non-canon games, the endings screw over the drivers who wish for them, in some ironic twist, but in this one, everyone got screwed over, including the Wish Granter. Very predictably, but I did crack up when I saw Sweet Tooth drive off that cliff. So maybe it was worth all the irritation that led up to that point. Also, I just learned that the big-headed clown, who serves as the Metatron for this game's silent Sweet Tooth, is voiced by John St. John. I knew he was in this game, but I didn't realize 
He voiced that character. There's a, another driver that has a Big the Cat voice. But I'd never heard a voice like that clown out of John St. John. Very dissimilar to the sort of thing he normally does. As usual, we unlocked a new bonus level, Nowhere to Hide. And we're gonna take Super Thumper there to wreak some havoc. Nowhere to Hide, as you can imagine, is the laziest possible level design you have ever seen. You can just tell from the preview there, it is a single, big, flat square. With pickups arbitrarily strewn about. So I gave myself five enemies. We're gonna see what Super Thumper can do when it is not just driven directly into a wall over and over again. They also do provide a whole ton of pickups in this little level. Plenty to kill all five enemies. And none of them will be left inaccessible once the ground explodes, because the ground ain't gonna explode like it did back in the pits. That means we won't have as many tricks up our sleeve to push the enemies off the edge, the way I just drove off myself. But we've seen before, when they go off the edge, they just hyperspace out, like I did myself. It was explained by Ridley Diddley in the comments that enemies will use hyperspace to escape a falling death two times, and then on the third fall, they will simply accept death. There have been times in the past where enemies have fallen prey to that, he dropped three times and just died from it. And other times where I managed to get them close enough to the kill plane that they didn't hyperspace out in time. As I definitely had not thrown them off three times in a row. But with no gimmicks at our disposal here, getting enemies over the edge is a real arduous task. Not at all worth it, because it's not going to happen three times. Did manage to get Trash Man off the edge once, using a whole bunch of power missiles. But really, the damage is gonna end up being what kills him in the long run. Fortunately, we have plenty of damage to go around. Most of the enemies are severely injured at this point, and I wanna start picking them off. Unfortunately, they're also really fast, and this square is pretty big, so they can zoom around and be pretty hard to hit. And, for some reason, I find it really hard to avoid these edges. After all my effort to get a bead on Quattro, he just hurls himself into me and explodes on impact. One way to get rid of a guy, that's for sure. Since falling deaths are so unlikely here, using the massive attack is actually a reasonable thing to do. And Trash Man happened to grab the enemy next to me while trying to get me and killed him in the process. Thank you, Trash Man. I'm glad I didn't kill you earlier. And I'll be even more glad when I kill you now. Our special is the Mega Fire. Like the normal flamethrower, but fires two gouts of flame. And they last forever. Just an unbelievably long time they stay out there. And it plays like a tiny little hip-hop beat the entire time. Which I could take or leave. But everything else about the special is absolutely great. This is actually a really, really fun boss vehicle to play as. And still absurdly overpowered. Huge amounts of armor. Quite fast. And that special, it never ends. Ironically, if you freeze someone beforehand, and then put the special on them. You can pretty much hold them in the flames for the entire duration. Give them the old frost burn. Made real short work of this level. Finishing it off with an invisible revenge against the Joneses. And then our run demise. Gotta do it every time. Another job well done. And with that, we say goodbye forever to logical, comprehensible reality. Things have been a tad off for the entire game so far, but starting next time, they veer into absolute madness and never look back. You cannot possibly be prepared, unless you played this yourself before. So you may as well just kick back and let the game drag you on an unfathomable journey from here on out.